Welcome to Citizen View, where citizens come to talk. Say, boy, we're talking about Electoral College because in the end, it's those 538 votes next week that will determine our president. It's the BCS football season, but the only college that people are going to be talking about this week is the Electoral College, which was in place since our original Constitution as the official mechanism of our electing our chief executive. Let's talk about the nuances, how it was established, how it works, and how we expect it to work next week. Andy, the Electoral College was put in place because our founding fathers were a little reluctant to put the decision of our chief executive in the hands of the common man. So they, they created this kind of elaborate system of a filter, bringing in certain elites to make that final decision hasn't always worked exactly as they planned, but it's still in place. Yes, it's the only aspect of our Constitution that had to be changed because of political parties and political slates, changed by the 12th Amendment. So these days, it doesn't work as that group of elites selecting the best qualified president. It works as a series of state-by-state -state elections where candidates, their goal is to win the plurality, to win the most votes in as many states possible so that they can win all of the electoral votes in those particular states. That's confusing. Let's break that down. So the Electoral College has 538 members. The total number is determined at a state-by-state -state basis depending upon the representation you have in Congress. Take Illinois, for instance. 18 members in the House of Representatives, two senators. Illinois will have 20 electoral votes, so on and so forth, in all 50 states to a total number of 538. And so what happens in Illinois is that both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party in the summer before the election, they assign 20 of their most loyal Republicans, if you're the Republican Party, or 20 of the most loyal Democrats in the state, if you're the Democratic Party, who will be that state's electors should Obama win and win the Democratic electoral votes, or should Romney win and win electoral votes who are the Republicans. So it's a plurality, Andy. The most votes in Illinois, for instance, if Romney wins the most votes, his 20 electors will vote in the Electoral College. If Obama wins the majority, the plurality of most votes in Illinois, his 20 electors will vote. And then they come together in December and vote, and actually the number isn't counted until January by the House of Representatives, but to win in the Electoral College, it's that first candidate to receive 270 electoral votes. And because of the system, the candidates won't campaign in the most populous states that have the most electoral votes. You don't see Obama or Romney in California, even though they have 50-some electoral votes, because we know California is going to be Democratic for Obama. And you don't see the candidates down in Texas, the second largest state with 30-plus electoral votes, because we know Texas will be Republican. And so where the candidates spend their time are those critical large swing states, those states that sometimes vote Democratic, sometimes vote Republican, that those are the electoral votes that we're uncertain of at this point, and those are the electoral votes that are really going to determine the winner of the presidential election. That's really the irony of this 2012 campaign, Andy, is it's a large and extremely important national election but the majority, the lion's share of all the attention is being focused on just nine or ten states, those swing states. Hey, if no candidate wins 270 electoral votes, Andy, the Constitution states, the House of Representatives chooses our next president. Now, that hasn't happened in a long time, but what has happened more recently, in the year 2000, one of the weaknesses of the Electoral College is that the winner of the national popular vote, when you count up all the votes on election night, and you look at the 100-plus million votes, sometimes the winner of the national popular vote doesn't win the majority in the Electoral College. And, of course, the last time we saw this was when George W. Bush won in the Electoral College with 271 electoral votes, even though Al Gore, his Democratic opponent, got a half million votes more than he did. Boy, the more we talk, the more confusing it seems to get. One thing will be clear, however, if we select a president next Tuesday, November 6th, the Electoral College will get another free pass for another four years. However, if there is confusion, if there is a complex ballot initiative of recounts, there might be another moment of time where we can say, you know, maybe we no. should reconsider this Electoral College once and for all. Well, because if you ask me, it's time for a national debate 
over the legitimacy of the Electoral College. Well, we've had this debate before, and we know that the reason you can't get rid of the Electoral College or change it is because you need a constitutional amendment. And there's enough states out there that benefit from the Electoral College, particularly small states like Wyoming that have mathematically much more power than they should have. And all those swing states like Florida, Ohio. Remember, you need to get three quarters of the states to approve a constitutional amendment. That's not even feasible to, to amend the Constitution with the Electoral College. There are other reform plans, but getting rid of the Electoral College just is not going to happen. Well, I'm here inviting your debate. Join us here at Citizen View, blog at citizenview.org, or have these discussions in your class with your teachers. Is it time for the Electoral College no. to be shuttered, closed down? No. We're the two teachers, and this is Citizen View. No fancy words, no fancy suits. Plain talk about issues you need to know. Just in time. <laughs>